Pop Culture Pastor. Well, I brought um, the Comic Con up for a reason. What was that, Cody? Uh, while we were there, you uh, mentioned you had a lot of friends there because you went to college there. Mm-hmm. And we met up with some of your friends at Red Lobster. We did. Red Lobster is weird because that was one of those things when I was a kid where I don't know if anything could touch the exquisite extravagance of the Red Lobster in my mind. Um, for me, that was for rich people and oh, rich yeah. people only. <laughs> they have lobsters in a tank. I don't want one, but it was amazing. So growing up for me, my parents always said, A, it's too expensive. B, it's fish and only your dad likes fish. (laughs) And C, it's expensive. (laughs) And so we never went as a kid so when I was a kid. So did red lobster used to be classier then was it, did it used to be more expensive than all the other restaurants? Cause now I would just say it's just another restaurant. Um, well, so I will say that their dishes are probably mid range in the, the chain restaurant game might not be the most expensive change chain restaurant, but it's still a little pricier than your basic ones. I mean, like, okay, so I was thinking of this question. What restaurants, as you've become an adult, probably chain restaurants, what chain restaurants as you become an adult have fallen farther in your mind than, like, so when I was a kid, <laughs> Red Lobster screamed rich people to me in my head because we never went there, <laughs> like, kind of similar to your story. And mm. then we had Red Lobster on Saturday, and I was like, this is like a coastal Applebee's. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, hey, I'm not trying to diss on Red Lobster. I mean, it's fine. It's a it's a chain restaurant. It's similar to Olive Garden. And when I was younger, Olive Garden was classy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now it's just the place where they keep bringing me, where I got to keep badgering the waitress to bring me more bread. In that way, Red Lobster, a lot of similarities. More biscuits. Just keep them coming. I will say Olive Garden, I, I felt like you used to have to dress nicer (laughs) to go to when I was a kid. And now it's like, well, I have on shoes, shorts, and a t-shirt. Let's go. (laughs) I'm rolling in. (laughs) I'm rolling in with my uh, cutoff t-shirt, my muscle shirt and uh, flip flops. And yeah, bring us all the bread. Yeah. That's, that's what I think of Olive Garden now, but you got to really stay on them. Is that a good business model? Is um, it a good business model to just to like offer people free bottomless bread? Well, I mean, Logan's and Texas Roadhouse do it as well. Yeah, must be something. I, I was trying to think of that, too, because bringing out a lot of bread, I mean, everyone still orders an entree. What's mm-hmm. the point of that? Is that just to get people there? Is that is that like something someone looks forward to because then half the people that you go with, they don't even eat their meal, right? Oh, I ate too much bread. (laughs) So I think that they do the bread thing to make up for subpar food (laughs) that people are like, Whoa, this bread's phenomenal. Uh, And then like every other dish, it's like, "Eh, this is okay. Yeah. Red lobster. Like if I'm being fair, I would rather go to Olive Garden. I think Olive Garden's, like, overall, the quality's a little bit better. Because Red Lobster, this is kind of why I brought this up, too. I imagined Red Lobster as a kid, for whatever reason, being this, like, classy place. And when you went there, you got, like, kind of this exquisitely made food, uh, which isn't the case, as as I called it, a coastal Applebee's now. (laughs) And, (laughs) And I find the quality to be kind of on that level. Again, no offense, Red Lobster, if anyone from corporate's listening we had a fine time and i wasn't expecting it to be this it's that's what i'm trying to say is the the level it was in my mind when i was a kid to what it is now so for comparison's sake i had the red lobster at past the gray poupon level <laughs> that that's where it was in my mind and now it's just uh, another uh, restaurant do, 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 do. <laughs> pardon me <laughs> will you pass me uh the ketchup yeah that's what i want all the ketchup for my steak please here at the red lobster thank you don't step on my flip-flops 
This is a wild story, Cody. I love wild stories. And it comes from uh, our neighbors to the south, Oklahoma. Oh. An Oklahoma noodler was arrested. Uh, do you know what a noodler is? Oh, yeah. Uh, not the kind of... Uh, so we there's two different kinds of noodlers. Oh. Okay, right? Which one were you thinking of? I'm thinking of the people that catch catfish by their hands. Yeah, okay. There's, so there's that noodler, which is the one this story is referencing. Um, yeah, people that go out and try to catch fish with their hands, which is great. That's, that's kind of... Uh, I always think that's like you're tapping into some old human things there that are just maybe instinctual. I don't know. I wouldn't do it. I could ever. I couldn't do it. I'd look like an idiot. Uh, and then uh, when I think of noodling, I think of the people who dance in the front row at concerts with, they kind of move their hands and wave motions <laughs> over the head. That's like, that's also noodling to me. I have never heard anyone refer to it as noodling. Oh yeah. And so now I will forever know. Yeah, I've, I've always referred to that as noodling. Usually it's like their number one fans, whatever band you're going to see, and they're out there in the front, and they're just noodling away with their hands, doing these wavy motions above their head. Fish. Sometimes they do that while they're spinning around. But that's not the kind of noodling we're talking about. This oh. guy was a fishing noodler. Mm. And uh, Larry Doyle Sanders, 53 years old, he was out noodling with his friend, catching catch fit, catfish with his hands. His friend Jimmy Knighton, also 53, along the South Canadian River in Pontotoc County in Oklahoma. Okay. All right. This is all according to KTEN uh, news there. Larry claims that while at the river, he discovered that his friend Jimmy intended to feed him to Sasquatch. Nice. You did not see that coming. You didn't see the twist in this story coming, did you? No, I did not. In an affidavit cited by NBC News, Larry indicated Jimmy attempted to get away from him so that the Sasquatch could eat Larry. That is amazing. I mean, that's interesting. You don't usually see that behavior out of a Sasquatch. <laughs> no. Maybe, maybe Sasquatch just didn't like Jimmy. Well, apparently Larry didn't like Jimmy either. <laughs> the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations told KFOR that Sanders thought Knight and basically tricked him into being out there that the two fought for an hour. What? An hour? You two gentlemen are too old for these shenanigans. Sanders allegedly choked Knighton to death near the river, then went home and confessed to his daughter, who's dating Knighton's son. Awkward. Does this, okay, does this relationship have any chance of moving forward? Like, think about, like, you're dating your soon, to, you, someone who you want to marry, and your dad kills their dad. Because your dad says that their dad um, hired a Sasquatch to kill and eat them. That is the most bananas reason. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. So you have these two guys who are apparently friends. You just don't noodle with random strangers or enemies. Yeah. Noodling, catching fish with your hands seems intimate. It is. And also if the catfish is big and it's in a tight space it can pull you down mm. and i rem remember watching river monsters and the guy jeremy wade went to oklahoma to go noodling and there was this big dude and he was like i nearly died noodling and so now i never noodle alone that's crazy i had no idea i would never want to touch a catfish I couldn't noodle because I wouldn't want to touch it. Well, I'd be afraid that there's like a snapping turtle or a snake down there. Okay. Well, that brings me to my next question. Are Sasquatches in Oklahoma a thing? Is that a thing? Oh, yeah. So as someone that has watched the hit show Finding Bigfoot. See, this is why I ask you because you watch all these weird, uh, <laughs> weird, possibly fictional wildlife sh documentaries. Bobo did say that in Oklahoma... These woods are squatchy. <laughs> so. Uh, squatchy. <laughs> but there's been sightings. There's sightings in almost every state. But Oklahoma, it, within a particular region of the state, did have a way elevated amount. So is there a part of Oklahoma that is tr has a lot of trees? Well, then, the, or is that is, I just assume that's where Sasquatch lived. There's parts that 
have more trees than other parts, clearly, because part of Oklahoma is like a desert. But then um, also the Ozarks kind of die off in Oklahoma. like Okay, yeah, the, extreme the eastern Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I assume that they're somewhere around there. I don't know. Okay, serious question. Let, let's be real serious. Okay. Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Do you think it's real? Do you think there's some out there? So I'm going to spoil it for you. Oh, okay. Spoil away. A, a teacher that I knew that was in the military, mm -hmm. he was on a base in Nevada. All right. And something had crossed one of their invisible sensors. Mm -hmm. And so their base went on lockdown and he had to go out with a couple of other people to go investigate what it was. And before they even got there, a satellite picked up that it was a cow that had gone loose from an adjacent farm mm -hmm. at that point he's like if bigfoot was real we would have already found it okay like, real easily so no because of the technology we have yeah he's saying with like invisible sensors the you know they have the wildlife cameras that activate with movement he mm -hmm. said we would have seen legit and the government Perfect. literally would have it on satellite cameras, like literally could see it from space. Well, then this guy killed his friend for nothing. I assume he did. Well, that. Sheriff John Christian told uh, K-10 that his, quote, his statement was that Mr. Knighton had summoned Bigfoot, summoned him oh. to come and kill him. And that's why he had to kill Mr. Knighton. Uh, and then he s concludes this statement with saying he appeared to be under the influence of something. No, yeah. no there substances or uh, kids. Uh, drugs are bad. Yeah. Same way. Um, yeah. Slash. You cannot summon Bigfoot. So now not only has human life been lost, but now Cody has completely wrecked our hope that Sasquatch was real. That's what I'm here for. All in all, this has been kind of a downer segment, Cody. When you started that story, in my heart, I really believed this was going to end with him finding proof that there was Bigfoot. No. Mm -mm. Man, I don't know. I'm really sad now. Okay, Cody, we need to talk about this story. Yeah. Because we are in a position to be able to answer, uh, to be able to bring some real expert commentary on this story. Because Rolling Stone had a scoop. Rolling uh, Stone magazine. You've heard of them? I have. Most of the time, I have beef. But we'll <laughs> see what their scoop is. You might possibly have beef with this. <laughs> they had an interesting scoop. About the Liberty Council's uh, uh, Peggy Nineber claiming that she prays with Supreme Court justices. Okay. Right? The article claims that there's a conflict of interest since the Liberty Council brings lawsuits before the Supreme Court. Okay. So basically, the implication here is that this woman who brings cases to the Supreme Court like represents a certain side of the case mm -hmm. um, has some sort of relationship enough with the, the judges where they will pray before these, I guess these, uh, what do you call a, a court procedure, a proceeding proceeding yeah. or hearing. So they're saying that there's a conflict of interest that either she is getting preferential favor and treatment from the Supreme court or that, um, she isn't doing her job to the full extent because she is buddy buddies with the Supreme Court. Well, that's apparently what they're alleging. Now, for their for their part, Liberty Council founder Matt Staver denies that any prayers with Supreme Court justices have occurred and didn't and couldn't explain why she said what she said. Which okay, I'm, I'm I don't really care. I don't yeah, about all of that. Like to me, that sounds like you know why do you know football teams pray together after football games? I was going to say this sounds like sporting events where <laughs> literally you'll see opposite or players from opposite teams join together and pray either before or after or both. Yeah, at bigger gatherings where there's a meal, we all pray together before we eat. It doesn't mean that we we're getting along with everyone at the time. 
Yes. Like, this, it, you just have to understand when we think, if you're not religious, you may not understand when prayer happens, which is supposed to be all the time. It doesn't mean that when we're praying that we're even praying from a position of being on the same side. There are several denominational factions that don't get along at all and preconceived notions about this group versus that group within Christendom. I oh, mean, yeah. there are so many things that are dividing lines that if you told me she prayed and I, I'd be like, well, it doesn't have a bearing at all. Yeah, it wouldn't. Um, this sounds like the beginning of a joke, but if I said, you know, an, an evangelical, a Mormon and a Jehovah's Witness walk into a building to argue, uh, but then they first they prayed together, that wouldn't be weird to me at all. No, that that would be like, well, OK, sure, sure. They did. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I feel like the writer of this Rolling Stone article, first of all, just doesn't understand what prayer is. And that is going to become really evident. Uh, so basically uh, what we have here is the Rolling Stone is trying to out what they say is preferential treatment because of a claim made by someone on the Liberty Council who brings lawsuits before the Supreme Court. And you can ask, you can probably um, come to the conclusion that the, the what they're representing is conservative interests. Correct. I would presume yeah. with Liberty Council. Yeah. Basically, one of the people on the Liberty Council said that, oh, yeah, we pray together sometimes before these proceedings, which, again, uh, someone as someone who prays and is in and has of the faith and is in a church, this is not abnormal. No, and it's not a sign of like any sort of collusion. Like I said, opposing football teams will beat their heads in for, you know, 60 minutes and then pray together. And, and sometimes they pray together before, sometimes they pray together after. I've been at church board meetings where it began with prayer and then it got ugly. Yeah. So it, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what prayer is, even off the bat. And if that's not clear to you before, it's certainly going to be clear to you now. Because in this article, the Rolling Stone says this, quote, prayer is a powerful communication tool in the evangelical tradition. All right. Okay. You're right. Communication between you and God. But I don't think that's where they're going. Okay. It goes on. The speaker assumes the mantle of the divine. I'm sorry, what? No. (laughs) Wait, what? I mean, you could say they act as... uh, I'm never praying again in public. (laughs) As a go-between. Someone that uh, intercedes... That, I would be like, okay, we can have a conversation around that thought, but as someone that intercedes on behalf of the group and God, but to say they take on the mantle of the divine. Yeah, and they're going to double down on the weirdness. So, prayer is a powerful communication tool in the evangelical tradition. The speaker assumes the mantle of the divine, and to disagree with an offered prayer is akin to sin. I, I don't even know what they're talking about. What in the world are you saying? I'm dumbfounded by this. I know the cool thing is to broadly generalize. And so I know there's a bunch of different versions of evangelicalism out there. Like, I'm not going to make say we're all the same, but I'm pretty sure y'all just made that up. Come on, Rolling Stone. Man. Like That doesn't make sense. Like, I want to know what who their source was for that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, It's just a. It's just a weird string of words. Like it was just like they had no real basis to say that. This is my problem with journalism as a whole, though, because it seems like, okay, so that goes beyond just reporting. So the news story here is that a lady with the Liberty Council said she prays with the justices. Now, if you have the context of being a religious person, this is not a big deal at all and does not represent any sort of collusion It just means that we pray all the time for things to go well or things to go, you know, without incident. And often we pray with people that we're not necessarily partnered with or even looking for the same outcomes. Again, I'll reference sports. Sports teams pray together all the time before and after games and they want to win and they're competitive 
and often they hurt each other. Um, even professional. Yeah. NFL players will join together before and after games to pray. Some posting teams. Praying together does not represent any sort of, oh, hey, we're after the same things here and uh, wink, wink, handshake, handshake. There's no story here, but our journalism often goes beyond this because there will be these throwaway lines where they're not reporting a fact. In fact, what they're doing is stating some sort of opinion, and then they don't offer any sort of grounding or basis for their opinion. So this article just says prayer is a powerful communication tool in the evangelical tradition. The speaker assumes the mantle of the divine and to disagree with an offered prayer is akin to sin. And then they just move on like, what? No, 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 no. Hold on. Let's not zoom past that because what you just said was rubbish. That was trash. Yeah. Yeah. And you're trying to make a point about something. And here's the problem. Anybody who's already mad at the Supreme Court is going to immediately read that and agree with it and say that that's truth. That's going to be truth to them from now on because some reporter said it. And this is the problem with our state of journalism right now. It's like, look, you either report the news or you give opinion. But we've, we've mushed those together. We've mashed them together. Everyone calls it fake news. It's not really fake. It's just got your opinions in it. But the problem is, is the people reading it don't make that connection. To them, it's just reporting of news. They're not reading it under the context of it's an editorial. Yeah. You know what I used to do in the newspaper when I'd see editorial? I wouldn't read it when I was growing up. You know why? Because I was there for the news. I wasn't interested in anyone's opinions. That's the way we used to be with the news, by the way. I wasn't necessarily interested in reading letters to the editor. You know why? Because when I realized even as a young person that people's opinions were often full of hyperbole and it wasn't real. It's, it's filled with emotion and feeling, which I can understand. I can empathize with, but often makes your viewpoint skewed. We knew that intrinsically at some point before the last 10 years. Oh, this is us. When does this go back? Can we, can we turn this around? I have had people who teach journalism tell me I'm crazy. Oh, that's not happening. This is just journalism. No, it's not. Uh, so I really feel the beginnings of it takes off with like people like Hunter S. Thompson, where the thing that they covered does, is no longer the priority. It's them being in the story somehow. And so a lot of people, journalist types, are like, well... He flipped the industry on its head. Let's be more like him. And then you have the advent of social media where it is broadcasting our opinions and our thoughts loudly. People see that that at least gets clicks. And so now newspapers and magazines have to go this way of we have to not only have ourselves entered into it because we have to elevate us. Why not? And then we also have to double down on our claims and have opinions because that's going to draw people to either engage for us or engage against us. And that is good for business. Yeah, I think the aspect of what you're talking about is interesting there because that is clearly one aspect is that um, in a lot of ways, the, the state of journalism changed because it had to because of the Internet. Um, there were there were environmental changes, I guess you could say, in the world of journalism, because all of a sudden newspapers and magazines weren't they weren't necessary anymore because they the Internet never were to begin. Oh, with. that's not true. They were they were. I, I come from a time when I can tell you that the newspaper was a part of most a lot of people's beginning of their day. I doubled down on my cynicism. Okay. Well, you know, then you fit right in (laughs) these days. But I can tell you that they were, but at some point they became unnecessary. And journalism had to scramble because we're a capitalist society. In order to survive, they had to make money. And so, like, it's not – this isn't a pointed finger. I'm not blaming anybody because I understand what made this happen. All of a sudden, you had to generate clicks. 
You had to get people to your website. You had to get people to follow you on social media. You have to get people to share. Like, listen, we do a podcast that has social media. I run a radio station that has social media. I understand the idea of you have to generate views and likes and and get people to follow you on social media. I understand all of that and why it's important. But what I think we missed is how it changed the environment of what it is that journalists do. Yeah. And so I think that was part of it. The other part I think of what's happening here is I think we're still being affected in a big way by two generations. Okay. Uh, One is the greatest generation, sometimes called the GI generation. That would be the folks who fought in World War II. The folks who, who went over celebrities, athletes went into the service, women working in factories. This was a, a, is a watershed moment in American history. Probably the last moment where we can say, we're the good guys, <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying that we're not, that we're bad. I'm just saying that there's, there's now there's shades of gray in most of the time there's shades of gray, but that was probably the last time we could point to and say, man, that was an evil in the world. And we stepped up. We did. So that generation carries this huge weight in our collective consciousness and then their kids the baby boomers the generation that comes shortly after that they did this thing where all of a sudden they were like they were rebelling against certain things wrong in the country that they saw certain things we weren't doing right which is a normal part of um, moving forward trying to make things better for everybody and so we revere them too because they, they what they fought the man they stood up for what they thought was right and so we revere them too now I think every generation after them has come to this place where we feel a little guilty that we're, that we're too comfortable and we got to search for ways we can fight the man. Does that make sense? Well, we're trying to search for relevance or becoming historical in some regards because you can look at the hippies as I'm calling them uh, (laughs) and be like, well, they were, fighting for civil rights and they're fighting against Vietnam and they were bringing down Richard Nixon and Watergate. Yes. They're huge issues. Yes. It was uh, like in the protesting world, in the world of common humanity, these are world war two moments for the boomers Mm -hmm. for the hippies as you called them. Yes. (laughs) Your words, not mine (laughs) in a way, in a sense, I think we're trying to live up to that now. What I'm not saying is that there aren't issues. There are not problems. We can always get better. We can always improve. But I think we elevate them to make ourselves feel better about the fact that we're not fighting against, we're not fighting a war of civil rights most of the time. We try to elevate it into that. Yeah. We make every issue about our rights now. Because I think it's not because the issue, now again, it's not. I'm not saying the issue is not important. I'm just saying we elevate it to make it seem bigger than it is. Because we want to be on the right side of history. Yeah. It's just strange. And I think it ends up, when we elevate it, it ends up making more opponents for yourself than you would have had. Mm-hmm. Um, because for every um, action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Correct? In, That's a scientific law. That is. And it appears to be true even in the real world. Even in sociological Yes. kind of things. And I think we're seeing that. And all of that has led to this place in journalism where I think there's sensationalism and there's sensationalism and maximizing of things. We have to make it seem bigger than it actually is. And that's a problem when you're trying to fool people into thinking, you know, like the world's going to end in 10 years because of global warming. I also wonder if within a movie I watched very recently in theaters over the past weekend, There's a scene where this guy who's the head over a large group of deities is like, yeah, I'm afraid, but fear is not good for us. So we're going to pretend that everything is fine and dandy. (laughs) And for a while, I think that that did happen in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so now we're having the complete opposite of that where the sky is falling every time something little happens and so we have disproportionate fear here here's what we're learning about ourselves Uh, we have no balance 
No. No, 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 no. We go to one extreme to the other extreme. We don't do this thing where we sit in the middle. In fact, if you try to sit in the middle, you'll get called a fence setter, a coward, all sorts of things. You are a part of the problem. (laughs) That's my favorite. (laughs) Yes. That's my favorite. If you don't believe what I believe, then you are the problem. What? (laughs) Say what now? I was just over here minding my own business. How can I possibly be a part of the problem? Because you're being complacent within the problem, Dave. Yeah. I don't know about all that. Okay, Cody, this is either genius marketing or it's totally ridiculous. KFC is trying out a new type of chicken nugget in an effort to attract younger consumers. They're aiming it at Gen Z, they say. Ew. Why? Why you? They should be aiming at an older oh. millennial. Well, my first thought was like, oh, is it free? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bazinga. That was uh, lower percentages of Gen Z have jobs than oh, yeah. at the same ages that their previous generations did. And then when the ones that do work want 20 hours, $20 an hour minimum wage and stuff, they're the ones screaming the loudest. Anyways, it was a bad joke. I And I told it. I, I, I own it. You went there. Uh, Starting Monday, KFC is offering Kentucky Fried Chicken Nuggets in restaurants in Charlotte, North Carolina for a limited time. They're they're trying it out in a few places. The nuggets are made with white meat and KFC's signature 11 herbs and spices, and they come in servings of 8, 12, or 36. Kick rocks, McDonald's. But also, did KFC not already have something like this? I'm failing to see why these are so different. I feel they had the popcorn chicken at one point. Yeah. So these are just a little bigger? It would be bigger and probably softer batter. Because I feel popcorn chicken's crunchy. Huh. They said, uh, quote, we're targeting young customers like Gen Z and millennials. Yeah. Who are interested in boneless chicken options. I'm all here for boneless chicken options. I'm Gen X. Are we not interested in boneless chicken? No. I dig boneless chicken. You want that bone-in stuff. I do? (laughs) This is all news to me. (laughs) Quote, the earlier you can engage with a consumer, the more potential you have for building loyalty and building frequency over the course of more years. I'm completely lost. I don't understand why boneless chicken is so Gen Z millennial. Because we grew up with B-dubs having it, and now the hut has it. Everybody has chicken nuggets. They're chicken nuggets. You can call them boneless wings all you want, but they're chicken nuggets. That's what a boneless wing is. And it's taken them years to come around on the chicken nuggets because McDonald's has been doing this forever, although not always all chicken. (laughs) Gen Z says less interested in dining out than other generations were at their age, making it even more important for restaurants to try to grab their attention. How does this grab anyone's attention? This is a story about KFC putting out chicken nuggets. It is unheard of, Dave. It's <laughs> global news. No, really. no, it's not news at all. I, I'm first of all, the only thing news here is I am gobsmacked to find out they didn't already have chicken nuggets. No, they had chicken strips though, which they used to have honey barbecue chicken strips that were amazing. I mean, granted, I would love all the KFC here. I miss I miss some KFC. I like KFC, but come on. This is not news. This is news to me. I am just so confused by this article about this KFC trying to win over Gen Z. It says this among all consumer groups, competition in the fast food world is tight. And one way for brands to stand out is to test new items and make changes to menus whenever possible because it creates buzz. It doesn't even matter what the product is. So they're just pretending that chicken nuggets are new. And now everything Taco Bell has ever done makes sense to me. Because all this time I've been wondering, why does Taco Bell come up with great menu items that are good, that people like, and then take them off? They're always changing their menu. And I'm like, no, you found it. The stuff is good. Leave it alone. Because they're owned by the same company. This is so weird. I think this among... Any other difference in the generations? This is the big one. Because here you have consumer groups saying that, oh, yeah, you have to constantly be changing. 
creating buzz. It creates a buzz and it that activates the FOMO, the fear of missing out. And this is all about, this is like Gen Z millennials are all about this. Meanwhile, Gen X is like, we fear change. No, we don't want change. Change is bad. Slash, they might already have a brand loyalty from Gen X because you That's grew true. up with the original. That's true. And I'm loyal. That's Gen X. You may not, there may not be a generation more loyal than Gen X, mm. even against our better judgment. Even when we know we're being taken advantage of, we're like, I just can't quit you, Taco Bell. <laughs> I just can't quit you. Even though we've been abused, you, you're you changing your menu, you're, you're two-timing us with Gen Z, you're trying to win Gen Z's hearts. My, my big complaint is, I think the corporation that owns KFC and Taco Bell's the Yum brand, mm. which they also mm-hmm. own Pepsi and Pizza Hut. Why does Pizza Hut stink so bad at making pizza that's a good question i don't know i don't know if everything's weird now i've said this before um on our radio show that i feel like out of i was gonna be a lot older when i started feeling like an old person when i started looking around and like recognizing what's going on around me as foreign like this is not the world i grew up in the country i grew up in and sometimes it's big, big things. And sometimes it's little things like this, like even how they, they market mm-hmm. and, and the way that fast food places and restaurants operate where, just, where they're just basically saying, oh, yeah, we just changed the menu to change the menu. There are certain items I feel that you should never get rid of. Don't just go changing the menu willy nilly. Don't go breaking my heart. <laughs> This is okay. So you got a little older millennial in you. Yeah, that I'm okay if you introduce new items, but let's not go ahead and just revamp the whole menu. I feel like I should say it again. Taco Bell, call me. Taco Bell Retro. I think it's a great idea. And I think Gen Z, or not Gen Z, Gen X and older millennials would flock to it. Well, we're the ones driving, so. I feel like we got skipped. I feel like, you know, there was the greatest generation and then the boomers wanted it all so badly. And then they, they've held on for so long. Boomers did just clawing like, you know, like bleeding their from their fingertips. They're holding on so hard. And then finally, it's about to be our moment. Gen X is about to have their time because we just been waiting back in the weeds. Unassuming. We're not like that. We're not power grabbers. You know, we're just waiting. For, we're waiting for our turn, being patient. And then boom. Millennials and Gen Z just hop right over us. <laughs> like, when, when's going to be my time? <laughs> Your time has come and gone. This is very disappointing. In the blink of an eye. <sighs> I guess. I guess so. I think they're, I think all these accounting and I think all these firms that gauge what people want are making a big mistake by overlooking Gen X. Hey everybody, Dave here. Thank you for listening to our uh, little odds and ends, our leftovers of our radio show podcast. Uh, This is just a little filler pod that we give you guys to tide you over to the main pods that come out every Friday morning. So thank you for listening. If you like or want to hear more of our radio show, uh, if you're into Christian music, if that sort of thing is your bag, uh, but maybe you're tired of what the Christian music stations play you, uh, you'll find something different on the station we're on. It's called KFEX 93.1 Firescape Radio. It's part of a, a youth ministry here in the town that we're in, and we invite you to listen. It's something new. We, we play a lot of indies. I don't know if you know this, but uh, we're actually living in the golden age of Christian music right now. And most people don't know it um, because you're used to thinking, oh, Christian music. Well, there's less talent in Christian music than there is secular. But that's actually not the case anymore. There's lots and lots of talented people making music who are Christians. uh, But because of the way Christian radio works, you know, the bigger stations, they only play about the same 15 to 20 artists kind of over and over again. Well, That's why we have our station, KFEX. So if that interests you and you want to hear more of us right now, our morning show uh, is it's in the morning. That might change soon, but we'll let you know if that does. If you want to listen to it anyways, uh, go to www.kfex931.com. 
or you can download our app on your iPhone or your Android phone. Uh, it'll be in the app stores of those respective devices. Just go in there, search KFEX. You will find our app and you can listen to us anywhere in the world right there. Uh, so give it a shot. We'd love for you to do that. Also, while we're talking about the pod, make sure you're subscribing to the pod and give us a, a, a give us a rating, give us a review, give us a little write up. That helps the visibility so that more people can discover the pod. And the more people that discover the pod and listen, the more things we can do. There's so much more uh, that Cody and I want to do. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.